Houston, that you hear me in Zoom land? Nods and thumbs up. Great, good, so glad. All right, thank you all for being here tonight so much, and thanks for being patient while we work through our technical issues. This is our first hybrid forum. We've done two forums so far, this is our first hybrid one. Um, so there's a bit of a learning curve, but uh, we're really excited to be able to offer this option as well. So thanks, um, thanks again. My name is Eva Zaret. I'm a public health specialist at Central Vermont Medical Center. I'm also the project coordinator for the Central Vermont Prevention Coalition. Um, as I mentioned, we have been doing a series of community forums on drugs and alcohol across Central Vermont. We've held two so far, one in Montpelier and one for sort of the Northfield area. And now we're here at U32 for um, a bunch of different towns. Um, so a couple of logistics. Um, if you haven't gone through Zoom logistics so far in the pandemic, congratulations. But if you could just keep yourselves on mute um, until you have a question, and then uh, you can use the raise your hand feature if you'd like to speak. The chat box is going to be monitored tonight, so please feel free to put information in there. Um, and we have a Q&A session planned, so if you have an immediate question, feel free to ask it, but we do have a great Q&A session at the end. Um, and we'd love to see your faces, uh, but there's no obligation to have your camera on. Um, we're going to be sharing a lot of resources tonight. Um, we, For those of you in the room, we have printed sheets in the back that have all the contact information on them and a little bit more information about our coalition. Um, if you're on Zoom, please feel free to screenshot, take photos, and we will send out um, a copy of that document as well. Um, Lastly, I just want to take a moment before we get started to acknowledge that there are most likely folks here tonight, both virtual and in person, who have been impacted by drug and alcohol use, um, whether it's their own experience or that of a loved one. And there may be people here tonight who have lost somebody um, to an overdose or to drug or alcohol use. And so we ask that you please keep this in mind when you are speaking, asking questions, um, and making comments. Um, and we're really grateful that you're here and in the room with us tonight. All right, so I think we're doing the agenda next. Is that right, Olivia? Yeah. Even Olivia, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. Just one thing. It sounds like somebody's trying to get into the Zoom. So I don't know if you can monitor the waiting room as well. I know it's a lot to operate at one time. Or yeah. I can sit up there and attempt to monitor the waiting room. Yeah, let me. I don't you see anyone waiting. Okay. Did you hear somebody waiting? I got a text that someone was trying to get in. Hmm. Okay. I'll keep an eye out if I see an alert. It'll okay. alert me. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. So tonight we are we just did the welcome. We're gonna ask you a few questions that are like a little bit painful, but we have to ask them because we have federal funding. Um, we're gonna do an overview, a quick overview of drug and alcohol use in Vermont to sort of set the stage of why we're here tonight and why we feel like this is important. Um, we're going to share resources that are available for drug and alcohol use um, here in central Vermont, and we have people on Zoom and in person from uh, some really amazing organizations. And then we're going to talk uh, a little more specifically about prevention and youth. Um, and then we'll stop talking, and we'll let the community ask questions, make comments, start dialogue. Um, spark ideas, uh, and we'll take some notes while all of this is going on and make sure that we're compiling everything and get back to you. Then we have one last poll and we'll be done for the evening. Great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I see some answers coming in. I appreciate that. 
I'll just give it a few more seconds. And then the last one, I promise, uh, is just a two-part question. This is for us to know whether it's or not um, we're, we're communicating to you what we're hoping tonight. So the first question is, if, I, if someone I know was struggling with drug or alcohol use, I would know what resources to point them to. And then the second is, there are actions that I can take to make my community a healthier place for young people.
Okay, so what resources are available in Central Vermont to address some of these things that you just talked about? Next slide. So the first thing I want to start with is the Central Vermont Prevention Coalition, which you've likely heard of because we are the ones sponsoring uh, these community forums. The Prevention Coalition, there's an umbrella here because it's really an umbrella organization under which are 30 to 40 organizations in Central Vermont that have all identified drug and alcohol use, substance use, as either the key uh, area that they work in or something that touches the lives of the people that they serve um, and that uh, they want to work towards addressing. The coalition was started seven years ago or so with, by some emergency room doctors at CVMC who acknowledged that people were coming into the ED, they were seeking help, and they were kind of handing them some pamphlets on the way out and didn't really know what was out there. And they said, we need to do more than this. So they gathered everybody in the room. Um, and seven years later, this group has been meeting every month um, and has done some really pretty remarkable things, created some amazing programs, brought in a lot of funding, um, and is starting a real big community engagement effort, which is part of what we're doing here tonight. So Dr. Mark Detman, is one of the co-founders of the coalition. He's generally here, but he is traveling. Um, I'm the project coordinator. And Olivia is an AmeriCorps VISTA serving us with us this year as the community organizer. So we're really not the ones that have services to offer, so I'm really excited to turn it over to those that do. And I'm gonna start with Matina Anderson from Vermont Cares. I am so impressed, I just want to say about this hybrid version because I do trainings a lot and I've done a hybrid once and I said never again. So <laughs> this is maybe changing my uh, attitude to hybrid trainings <laughs> to make it more accessible. Um, thanks for being here in the room and on Zoom. My name is Martina Anderson. I'm the harm reduction program manager at Vermont Cares. We um, are an aid service organization that started in the 80s and then in the early 2000s, we brought on the harm reduction side of things too. We have we serve 11 counties um, in Vermont, and in central Vermont, our brick and mortar office is in um, Barrie, and we co-locate with the People's Health and Wellness Clinic, which is, a, is at 51 Church Street. Um, we are there every Monday, 9 to 5. People can just walk in, no appointment necessary. Um, we also have two mobile vans, and each of our staff utilizes our own cars to literally meet people where they're at. We take that quite literal, actually, um, and so we bring, you know, all these services that you see here um, and more, you know, to people with our vans or in the office. Um, one of the most important things for me uh, to tell everyone is that our services are 100% anonymous. We don't know people's names, we don't give out any information. You can imagine it can be really difficult for people to access our services. It's 100% anonymous and it is 100% free. Um, one thing that is not on here yet as a service that I'm personally super excited about that we started two weeks ago um, is we now also offer low barrier and immediate access to buprenorphine, um, which is Suboxone, is the, the form that we offer. Uh, for people who want to access this medication in the moment for, to support their path to wellness and treatment. Um, besides what we do in our offices and with our mobile units, um, we also work with community members, schools, we have been in U32 actually a couple times, um, as well as other um, you know, law enforcement and um, other community organizations where we offer free trainings and one is on harm reduction, and one is on opioid overdose education and um, how to use Narcan, the opioid antagonist medication. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Anna. you. Thanks for being here. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to Evan Smith from Central Vermont Medical Center to talk about um, drug and alcohol treatment uh, available in Central Vermont. Hi, Eva. Can you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> oh, great. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Evan Smith. I'm a licensed clinical social worker up at Central Vermont Medical Center. I oversee uh, the hospital's uh, efforts around uh, medication-assisted treatment for folks with opioid use disorder uh, and do a lot of coordination across uh, Washington County. Um, I just 
one of the things I wanted to quickly share with you guys uh, today, Eva had shown you some of the numbers about ov opioid overdoses. And I wanted to kind of just share with you that the state of Vermont came out with its uh, most recent report on 2021, which had some of that data. But Washington County, of all the counties in the state, has the highest rate of opioid uh, deaths. And I think it's just important for us to kind of recognize the impact of that uh, in our own community. And then just another statistic that I came across uh, recently was uh, the Journal of American Medical Association uh, had some information that showed that the, the difference uh, between 2019 and 2020 was in the rate of alcohol related deaths jumped 25% from one year to the next when the pandemic started. And when you look back to when that data was first started being collected since 1999, the rate at which it's increased has never been greater than 2.2%. So for it to go from a rate of 2.2 to 25% is just uh, unfounded, uh, obviously. And uh, certainly a reason for concern for all of us in regards to uh, ensuring people have access to uh, substance abuse treatment. The numbers you see on the screen here are uh, local numbers for our community uh, MAT team uh, at the Central Vermont Medical Center. So folks who are looking to get on medication assisted treatment or uh, have information around trying to access services, uh, we're there uh, and we're more than willing to answer any questions for folks have. There's also uh, information here from uh, the state um, wide uh, sponsored link here, which is called Vermont Help Link. You may have heard uh, of it. Uh, they were doing a lot of advertising recently regarding this service, but uh, what they do is they get people first appointments uh, across the state of Vermont for substance abuse treatment with residential level services or intensive outpatient all the way down to individual counseling uh, at services throughout the state. So just wanted to share that with you uh, and looking forward to answering any questions you guys have regarding treatment. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ahmed. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up the um, impact that alcohol has been having recently because I think opioids do get a lot of attention, um, which it needs, but alcohol also is really impacting our communities um, in, in real ways um, more than ever. Great, so I'm gonna turn it over to Bert Cleveland now from Washington County Youth Services Bureau to talk about treatment, but very specifically for young people. Hi. I'm Bert Clavens. Uh, I'm a licensed drug and alcohol counselor, and I uh, direct the Healthy Youth Program, or HIP, HYP, which is a program of the Washington County Youth Service Bureau. And we're now located in Berlin, Vermont. We were in downtown uh, Montpelier for many years, and uh, just recently, last year, we located. Um, Health Youth Program provides uh, outpatient substance use education and treatment that's geared specifically to the needs of adolescents and young adults. We serve um, youth ages 12 to 25 years old. And we utilize a holistic approach to treatment that emphasizes relationship building, draws in a variety of treatment approaches to address needs, and is flexible to the unique challenges of young people seeking treatment. I think that's one of the most important things is that, you know, they're not just little adults, you know, working with uh, adolescents uh, is there's some real um, different things, the way the brains operate and everything, <laughs> you know, as we all know. And uh, so we really try to take that into account in the way we do our work. Um, the Youth Service Bureau also provides a range of other programs for young people, such as for mental health counseling, transitional housing services. We have the Basement Teen Center in Montpelier. All of our services are easy to access by calling the number on the slide and talking to our central intake staff. Um, the only thing I'd like to say is that if you do think your, your child might be having an issue with drugs or alcohol, the best thing you can do is reach out for some help and guidance. It doesn't have to, you don't have to wait for it to be a big problem or it doesn't have to be a big problem to justify doing this. Uh, doctors, substance use counselors, school or mental health counselors, all of them can be helpful in just kind of helping you maybe get a better sense of what's going on and uh, what are the next steps to take. Uh, at the Healthy Youth Program, we're always happy to hear from you and try to answer any questions you might have. Thanks very much. Thanks for, for being here. Um, something I didn't call out 
out loud, sort of verbally from the previous slide, is that the emergency department at Central Vermont Medical Center, if you go there 24-7, you can receive, you can begin and receive treatment for drug, for opioids and, and alcohol at any point in time. And there are programs and systems set up in place um, for people. All right, um, I'd like to now turn it over to Hillary and Denton and Bob Purvis from the Turning Point Center in Central Vermont. Hillary is in person, Bob is on Zoom, so I'm gonna let you guys figure out. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bob can go first. Bob, why are, we're gonna have you go first, Bob. I was muted. <laughs> Okay, my name is Bob Purvis, and I'm the director of the Turning Point Recovery Center. We're located in Barrie, but we serve all of Central Vermont. All of our services are free of charge to anyone. We are also completely confidential. We're a peer recovery center, which means that everyone who works here has a personal history of an alcohol or other drug addiction and recovery from it. That's also true for me. I've been sober for almost 18 years now, and my life has never been better. Because we peers have quote unquote been there, we're able to relate to people who are struggling with substances in a way that others can't. Our job is to help each person find their own pathway to recovery, and there are many pathways to recovery. A recovery center is a place where a person can go to receive individual or group support. We also provide a range of programs that can help people regain their health and enrich their lives. A recovery center is also a place where people in recovery can meet and become friends with others who are doing the same thing and learn to once again have fun and play games while sober. Since this is a Montpelier audience, or at least many, many of you, I'm pleased to say that we are working in collaboration with the Montpelier Police Department to provide recovery coaches to support individuals who come in contact with a police officer. The most important service we provide is, a recovery, is recovery coaching, and I'm now gonna turn it over to our recovery coach program manager, Hillary, to explain. <clears throat> Hi everyone. Okay. Hi everybody. My name is Hillary Denton, and I am a person in long-term recovery. As Bob said, we are all peers. I am recovery coach, program manager for the Turning Point. Recovery coaches are people with lived experiences, and we're here to connect uh, folks with local resources and help them navigate all stages of recovery, but in particular, early recovery. This is a critical time in a person's life when they are deciding to make a change. And as Bob just mentioned, we honor many paths to recovery, and we believe that there are as many paths to recovery as there are people. Coaching can happen in a variety of ways, ranging from remote to in-person calls and texts, and is a free resource, and we support both individuals and families. Thank you for being here. And I'm gonna now turn it over to our friend and ally, Kathy. My name is Catherine Pisano. Um, I am a person in long-term recovery. I've been clean and sober since 2011. Um, in my life, I, I hit a really big rut in my life and I was addicted to opiates. Um, pretty much anything that, that you had that could get my thoughts different, I was addicted. And I didn't, even, I didn't care. Um, I was involved with the Department of Corrections for 10 years, federal and state. Um, we didn't have peer coaching back when I committed my crimes and when I was stuck in the mud, I was one of the first people to get naltrexone for medically assisted treatment. I was one of the first to get buprenorphine. I was one of the first to get methadone and I got myself out of that and into recovery. And my, um, my life has changed. I, the turning point was a, a huge asset for me during that me finding myself getting out of the mud. They were like a branch for me to be able to go. And they didn't have recovery coaches then, but I, my mother passed away in 2019 and it was you know, a little dip again, you know, like a little bump in the road, and I had to get myself together, and you know, I could message Bob at any time, and, and he was always there for me, Hillary always there for me, and it, I had to go through another transformation, losing my mother and taking care of, like, my disabled father, 
owing it to them because I had committed crimes against them and I needed to, to heal myself and heal my childhood and you know make that inner child grow and it helps me be a better peer support person. I currently work at Life Intervention at the Hilltop and I'm the team lead and it's amazing you know like to be able to do this and have people actually look up to me and say I want to be like you mm -hmm. is it's an elating feeling like my body tingles with it like I just when you sit and cry I'm crying with you because I've lost my children my brother committed suicide my mom and dad have died I've been to prison I you can't throw anything at me because I can feel it with you and I will sit and cry and I will as a peer support my main goal about it is I want you to be okay right now because then didn't matter and tomorrow isn't here yet so don't be anxious about it right now what are we doing right right now and if you get can get somebody to breathe you can change your life and I, I love doing that and yeah, Bob's an amazing, amazing person, and he's a rock for me. Um, thank you guys. I look forward to working with you guys more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, we're lucky to have you here tonight, and the Central Vermont community is really fortunate to have you working so hard for all the presidents. Um, thank you. Um, Neat. And last, uh, lastly, yes, no, it's not quite lastly. <laughs> lastly is prevention, and we're going to turn it over to Ann Gilbert, the director of Central Vermont New Directions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ann Gilbert. I'm the director of Central Vermont New Directions Coalition, which is based in Montpelier, but we cover all of Washington County. We've been a prevention organization for, um, since 1998. I live in East Montpelier, and our three kids have gone through Rumney School and U32. And, um, you know, it's scary to think about all these statistics and all this data that we have about our close-knit communities, you know, right here in central Vermont, and yet we're on the map as really having high, high rates. So in prevention, we're really talking about how do we stop it before it starts? You know, I'm very concerned about the 12 to 17 year old kids who are in school and figuring out how to get enough information out to parents. You know, maybe um, you know, um, engaging a bunch of different strategies to really work with your kids. And then the 18 to 25 year old population, I mean, we've got to start early when these kids are young. We have um, funding from the Vermont Department of Health to address tobacco, vaping, um, alcohol, underage drinking, cannabis use, which is now, you know, retail uh, cannabis stores will be opening in the fall, and, uh, and then prescription drugs. So it's been a privilege to work with all these community partners because it really does take a village, and, um, you know, with all these different experts and parents who are the experts in their own families. So I'm glad that you're all here, and you'll see a number of different resources that you'll be able to utilize to contact us if you need to. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Anne. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Matt Whelan, who's with the, the Vermont Department of Health, to talk about uh, some of the resources that they have. Hey, everyone. My name is Matt Whelan. I'm a prevention consultant, and I serve the Barry region. I work for the state's alcohol and drug abuse programs. Um, my role specifically provides community, community organizing support, program planning and consultation. We do presentations and trainings like this, uh, community grants information and guidance, and information and referral in the community. There are 12 of us throughout the state, and so I'm your local prevention consultant for Central Vermont. Eva? Great. Thanks, Matt, for being here. Um, so Matt, this is our, our panel that we've brought to you all tonight. Um, they're gonna be available um, in just a minute to answer questions that you might have um, and help facilitate conversation. 
But before we get to that, I'm just going to have Matt continue for a few minutes to talk about uh, prevention and youth. Great. Thank you, Eva. So uh, if you just indulge me for a minute and imagine a large river with a high waterfall, and at the bottom of the waterfall, hundreds of people are working frantically trying to save those who have fallen into the river and have fallen down the waterfall, many of them drowning. As the people along the shore are trying to rescue as many people as possible, one individual looks up and sees a seemingly never ending stream of people falling down the waterfall and begins to run upstream. One of the other rescuers yells, where are you going? There are so many people that need help here. To which the woman replies, I'm going upstream to find out why so many people are falling into the river. As she heads upstream, she notices bridges in various states of disrepair along the river. Some are strong, made of sturdy components. Others are weak and debilitated with missing boards or flimsy railings. It doesn't surprise her that most of the people falling into the river are crossing the poorly made bridges and those individuals that live near or travel across strong bridges are protected. Of course, all of the bridges along the river could use more reinforcement, but it's easy to see which ones need the most attention. In the stream parable, we know that certain groups of people are more likely to fall into the river than others. They don't fall in because of individual weakness or intrinsic flaws. Rather, we know that some people are privileged enough to live in communities with strong bridges, usually made from high quality materials that protect them from falling in and promote their safe passage across. And that's what primary prevention is all about. We're working to get upstream of the problem. So this is the third in a series of community forums that we're doing in central Vermont. You may have noticed that we organize these by super, supervisory union. One of the reasons is that we're able to dive in and analyze the youth risk behavior survey data that comes from the students that live in your community. The health department gathers near census level data on young people in Vermont with that survey. And we're very confident that it illustrates the risk behaviors and prevalence in their communities. I wanna start by just honoring that there are some major contributors to the root of this issue. We have social inequities, we have prejudices based on social categories of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, ability. We have institutional inequities in the distribution of investments, wealth, and power. We have individuals with adverse childhood experiences and trauma, mental health conditions. These are all root causes of substance use and, and addiction in the long term. And we certainly have a duty to work on these things and a duty to make societal changes that are needed to confront addiction in the community through these things and to create overall health. But these are extremely important things that we would struggle to change in a forum like tonight. Awareness certainly is paramount, but we need to make sure that we're also focusing on things that are important, but are also changeable. And so we're going to focus on things that, that are actually changeable. Hopefully, you'll be able to leave with, a, with an understanding of what you personally can do, what your family can do, what your community can do to actually make some change. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to bring some key points forward for you tonight. One is that Washington Central has lower use rates for most substances when compared to the state and to the county. So your, your school district, when compared to the county and to the state, is actually doing really well when it comes to substance use rates and prevalence. The second thing I want to bring forward is that Vermont's young people are among the highest users in the country for most substances. So, you know, even though Washington Central has low use rates when compared to the rest of the county, you're still in the top users when it comes to being a young person in the United States in general. Lastly, there are things that we can control to make change. Next slide. So I just wanna whip, whip through a couple of statistics here for you. So, so if you'll bear with me, um, and, I, and I do, I do wanna br bring these forward because your use rates are, are something that, that you should be proud of, at least within the context of, of Vermont. So here's the statistic for ever having had any alcohol. The folks in the, the students in your school district are at 46% for that number. This is high school students. 
Uh, and in Vermont, that number is 55%. Next slide. Here's that same metric for ever having used marijuana. Your school district's at 36% and Vermont is at 40%. Next slide. For ever having misused prescription pain medicine, Washington Central is at 7% and Vermont as a whole is at 9%. Next slide. Then finally, for those who have ever misused prescription stimulants, Washington Central is at 4%, Vermont as a whole is at 7%. Next slide. So you, you have those use rates, but I do just wanna point out that, that those numbers that we were looking at with 36% of students having ever had marijuana, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's great when you compare it to the 40% in the state, but 36% of students ever having had marijuana is still a number that is unacceptable. And anytime that students are using substances, it's impacting their brains and impacting their bodies. And we certainly need to make changes to address that. The survey also shows that fewer students in this school district drink alcohol and smoke marijuana before the age of 13, which is critical. We know that early use of of any substances puts young people at four times the risk of addiction issues later in life. More students in this school district believe it is wrong for someone their age to drink alcohol and smoke marijuana. And that has a direct correlation with use. More students believe that their parents would think it was wrong for them to use alcohol or marijuana, which is also correlated with use. And fewer students have access to marijuana and alcohol than students in generally in the rest of the state. So those things are really important. How bad they think it is for them, whether or not they think it's wrong for them to use, whether their parents think it was wrong, and whether they can actually get their hands on it. Those things really matter when it comes to youth use. Next slide. So I wanna just spend a little bit of time and just talk about what Vermont's youth use rates look like when compared to the rest of the country. So this is the number for current use of marijuana, having used marijuana in the past 30 days. For Vermont, that number is at 11%. The rest of the country is 7% for marijuana use in the past 30 days. Next slide. For alcohol use in the past 30 days, Vermont's 12 to 17 year olds are at 12%. United States generally for 12 to 17 year olds are at 9%. Next slide. Alcohol use in the past month, regular alcohol use. Vermont's 12 to 20 year olds, 27% compared to the United States as a whole of 17%. Next slide. Binge alcohol use in the past month. Our 12 to 20 year olds in Vermont are at 17%. In the United States as a whole, it's at 10%. Next slide. So it's important to think about the use rates that your school district has in the context of Vermont as a whole. You cannot let your, your guard down simply because your use rates are, are, are lower than the county and lower than the state. It's always sort of on the horizon. And the youth rate, use rates that you have are, the use rates in general for young people in the state are, are unacceptable. And uh, COVID, we think, will probably impact that negatively. Some of the risk factors like isolation and stress, those things have been exacerbated by COVID-19, and we anticipate that uh, use rates will rise as a, as a result. So there are things that we, can, can, that we can change that contribute to use. Number one is the availability of substances and the access that young people have to them. Number two is the amount that young people know about the impacts of substances on their bodies and brains. Number three, the amount of protective factors that are in a young person's life. And number four, the community norms around alcohol and other drugs. Next slide. So at home, we protect our children and our families from lead, asbestos, radon, cleaning chemicals, bad drinking water. All these things are in our home and we work hard to protect our children from those things. 
And in my opinion, it's time to add substances to the list. Alcohol, cannabis, tobacco, vaping products, prescription medications. These are things that are poisons and they need to be kept away from young people at all costs. Next slide. Bear with me on this slide. This one's a little bit wonky, but it points out that there are some protective factors that we measure that have a direct impact on whether or not young people use substances. Okay. What that chart on the right-hand side shows is that the young people in Vermont who ate dinner with at least one parent on four or more days a week engaged in substance use less. The young people that feel like they matter to people in their community engage in substance use less. Young people that have one or more teachers or adults in the school that they can talk to if they have a problem and engage in substances less. And those who believe their school has clear rules and consequences for their behavior engage less in substance use. And then finally, those who feel sad or hopeless in the past two weeks when the survey was taken also engaged in substance use less. So there are protective factors out there that add up, that, that make a difference in young people's lives and bolstering protective factors can really make a big difference. Next slide. The perception of harm is the number one reason that young people report, or the number one thing that correlates with use. And with retail marijuana on the horizon, we, we anticipate the perception of harm for marijuana uh, going down, meaning that young people are gonna think it's, it's less harmful. And we see that with with alcohol. And we anticipate that to correlate negatively with marijuana use in young people. And we anticipate seeing increased use. Community norms impact perception of harm. The more young people are exposed to alcohol use, the more young people are exposed to any use, the, more, the less likely they are to think that it's harmful for them and the more likely they are to use. And as alcohol continues to kind of work its way into the fabric of society, um, that really damages and undercuts the perception of harm for young people and leads to more use in the long term. Next slide. What you can do to make change. So you can continue to monitor the availability of substances to young people. Making sure that they can't get their hands on the substances is a great way to prevent early use. You can talk to the young people in your life about the impacts of substances on their bodies and brains. Talk early and often. Talking, having, having 60 one minute conversations is far more valuable than having one 60 minute conversation. So talking to young people early and often about their use. And, and I'll show you a resource just after this slide for, from the Department of Health for talking to young people. You could fo focus on bolstering the protective factors in young people's lives, maintain strong school policies and procedures. Policies are one thing. No school wants substance use with their students or on school grounds, but the procedures are another. You know, navigating towards restorative justice that bring students who are using back into the fabric of the school um, instead of sending them away is one path towards having strong policies and procedures for substance use. Promote the screening of students and the referral of students to treatment through things like youth screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment. Next slide. So here are some resources parentupvermont.org is our parenting website and I'll give you a little bit of a tour about what the first landing page looks like when you go there. Parent Up gives, gives Vermont parents facts and resources. They need to talk about alcohol, cannabis, mental wellness, and other issues. Central Vermont New Directions Coalition is your local support for substance use prevention and Anne just spoke. Next slide. So here's parentupvermont.org and this is what you see when you, when, you, when you hit that landing page. The prompts at the top are, why is my child at risk? How do I prevent? What do I look for? How do I get support? So sharing this resource with the parents in your life, using it yourself, if you have a young person in your life, uh, is, is one way that you can really kick off that conversation, start having those hard conversations about use. Next slide. Okay. And I will kick this over to Ann Gilbert to talk about 
uh, Drug Take Back Day, which is on April 30th. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you, Matt. So one of the ways that we can really um, reduce access, especially of prescription drugs, is to get them out of our house. And so the DEA and all of Vermont is really participating in Drug Take Back Day. It happens every fall and every spring. So on April 30th, it's a Saturday, it will be Drug Take Back Day, and we're hanging up flyers around town. You'll see these, or it's on Front Porch Forum. So from 10 to 2, you could go to any of these six sites that the sheriff has coordinated um, at police stations in Northfield, Barry City, Montpelier, at the Washington County Sheriff's Department, and also at Kinney Drugs on the Barry Montpelier Road and the one in Waterbury. But if you can't do it on April 30th, you know, you can go before then. We just want to sort of do this spring green cleanup of get them out of your house you know, um, by the end of April. If you can't make it that day, you can still go to any police station or the lobby at Central Vermont Medical Center or the Kinney's. We also have free mail-back envelopes. And these can, uh, you can get these at any library or your senior center or at your town office. We'll be stocking all the town offices. And all you have to do, postage paid, all you have to do is get your prescriptions, put them right in there, seal it up, drop it in the mailbox, and it's being sent off to Stericycle to be um, incinerated. We also have um, locking bags and boxes for people's medication. This comes with keys, and we have some free ones that are available to people at Central Vermont New Directions Coalition um, and through uh, your town offices. So we're really talking about locking things up or dropping them off or mailing them in a mail-back envelope. So I hope everybody can take a look at what's lingering around in your medicine cabinets because that's the number one place where kids say that they have access to them is in their home or in their friends' homes. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone, um, for speaking and sharing what you do in your amazing organizations. Thanks for everyone to everyone for listening um, for the past like, 45 minutes almost. What we'd like to do at this point is to open it up. Um, if you have questions for any of the experts and the panelists that are here tonight, we'd love to take your questions. If you have comments, statements, um, we really want this to be a time for community dialogue. Um, and we will take some notes uh, while you all are speaking. If you are on Zoom um, and you'd like to speak, uh, please use the raise your hand feature so I don't miss anyone. Um, and you can do that by using your reactions button in the bottom of your um, Zoom screen. Yes, Larry from East Montpelier. Hey, good evening, everybody. And thank you so much for a pretty interesting um, conversation here this evening. Um, at the risk of, of sounding like I'm questioning the data, I want to question the data or just, um, I, I have a question about it because I was so struck by the beginning comments that showed Vermont youth use so extremely high compared to the rest of the country. And I guess my question is, um, does the rest of the country use YRBS as a tool for determining um, uh, the use in their states. Um, if not, are we really looking at an apples to apples comparison? Sure, we're, we're an apples to orange, yeah. So I think that Matt had to go, but I can answer this question. So yes, the rest of the country does use YRBS. Um, it's conducted through the CDC and um, there's a set of standard questions that are asked of all students in all states and then schools can or states can add additional questions that they feel are relevant. So Vermont, for example, asked the questions about like, do you wear your helmet while skiing, which they wouldn't ask in Florida. Um, and Florida probably asked things about surfing and you know water safety that we wouldn't ask here. But there are these standard questions that are asked across the board. And they use some really fancy biostatisticians that uh, 
work through all of the data and make sure that it's accurate. They don't report on anything that the sample size is too small where it wouldn't be, you know, usable information. Um, so that, so yes. Um, so that's 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 great. I mean, I'm 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 really happy to 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 know that because obviously that's crucial in in this whole conversation. Um, so so now I'm even more more uncomfortable because I'm 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 thinking, why in the heck is is Vermont so high? I mean, what is so different about Vermont than New Hampshire or Massachusetts or New York? What what is it that our kids are experiencing that that puts them at higher risk than than other places? And um, you know, using Matt's parable of the of the uh, of the of the water, you know, what, why are so many of our kids falling in the in the water? Um, it it seems it seems um, I, I'm surprised by it simply because I, I generally think of Vermont as a largely safe uh, safe community to, to to live in. I mean, we devote a lot more resources to social services in Vermont than so many other states. So. Um, I, I, maybe too big of a question for 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 tonight, but uh, um, thank you for clearing up that issue about about the data. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm happy to answer it, and I think it's kind of exactly in part why we are here tonight. So I'd love to open it up to any of the panelists that are here, um, if you have thoughts on that really important question. Um, Evan or Bert might have some interesting insight. <laughs> Um, <laughs> possible, you know, I, I, I honestly, for, for me, it's less important, like how we, how we stack up next to this state or that state. I mean, I'd be curious to see all the numbers, you know, sometimes it's not, the differences are not huge. I don't know, but to me, what's more important is, is, is this an issue for, for youth in Vermont? And I think to me, that's what I take from those numbers in terms of why we might be higher than some other states. Yeah, I'm. Um, I don't really know so much. Yeah, maybe maybe someone else could speak to that. I'm in my line of work. We're just sort of dealing with what comes to us, you know. So I think the important thing is that this is an issue in Vermont, and you know, the, any idea that you know because we're, you know, it's the Green Mountain State and it's beautiful here, whatever that that you know drugs are not freely available around here and in every corner of the state it's just not true they are they are available and I mean that's what I really take away from those statistics that's the most important um, in terms of that question about why we might be hired some other states I I don't know I don't know the answer to that uh, Evan Smith here um, you know, dare I say cultural norms um, you know I, I wonder about that when you when you drill down into the YBRS data a little bit more um, and you start bringing it down on communities where there's higher rates. Um, and I, when we think of Washington County, I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's, you know, Montpelier and the Mad River Valley have higher rates uh, comparative to uh, your school district. Um, but, you know, I think when we look at this, part of it is parental, you know, parental acceptance of this. Um, and they tend to have higher rates in those communities of, 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 you know, issues around acceptance of, well, marijuana, it's, you know, I smoke it, it's expected. And now we're moving forward to, you know, legal, we have legal marijuana and we're going to be able to get it. But, you know, it's now coming to the point where it's, you know, you've got the marijuana and you've got the alcohol in the house and they're all legal. Um, but the message really needs to be, if the parents are people who drink and, and smoke marijuana, you know, it's illegal for you to smoke marijuana and it's illegal for you to drink until you're an adult. And then you get to make your own choices when you turn 21. Um, I, I just think it's, I, I do think there's a lot of cultural norms and acceptance of a teenager, teenage exploration and use of drugs uh, in this state compared to probably compared to some other states for sure. And if, if I could just piggyback on what you say there, I mean, you know, in addition to it being illegal, like this idea that I think a lot of people see the legalization of marijuana as being some sort of rubber stamp that it's uh, very safe. And th there's really no reason to think that alcohol has been legal for years. We know, you know, so is so are cigarettes. We know uh, nicotine. We know um, tobacco. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, 
you know, we know that these things are not safe and marijuana didn't suddenly become safer just because it became legal. But I, I do think, especially among young people, that that's, um, that's a bit of an assumption and uh, not a good one because at the same time as becoming legal, we're actually starting to get a lot more information that, that suggests that that population, the, the young population, the adolescent young adult population, prior to their brains you know, being completely developed at age 25, are probably the most at risk from long-term effects of marijuana use. So there's kind of, it's just sort of strange that those two things are happening at the same time. So becoming legal, and we're actually starting to get some, some valuable research that says, you know, this, this can be um, a very harmful drug, especially to uh, young people. Eva, just a minute to come in. Yeah, yeah, please, Anne. I was going yeah. to ask. So um, I think all of these things are important that Evan and, and Bert have mentioned. And thinking about um, uh, intergenerational, you know, I mean, it's time to try to help break the cycle from, you know, the grandparents and the parents using and the children are in the home. We're so thankful that there are so many recovery coaches that are helping an awful lot. But there are a lot of kids who just see this as normal. We're also, you know, on a highway when a lot of um, drugs have been able to come into Vermont, either from New York up through Canada. And also, it's important for all the towns to really, really create a vision for what they want their town to look like. I mean, we're so happy to have all of this craft beer and these distilleries. It's really big for business. It puts Vermont on the map. But when kids are walking to school and they see bar after bar after bar, or they're, you know, they're at an outdoor family-friendly event or a 5K, and the reward at the finish line is you know, more beer, and we're looking at retail cannabis where towns are voting to opt in, towns really need to take a look at where do you want those retail places so that adults can access it, but it's not kids who are seeing that all the time. We have learned so much from the tobacco industry over the years of not advertising anymore, not being able to ha you know, smoke in public. Um, and so the smoking rates went way down until the industry came up with vaping. And then they started creating a whole new problem. So we have a lot to learn. We just need to translate that into the alcohol and the cannabis issues as well. Sarah, thank you for a really um, thought-provoking question. Um, I think it's incredibly um, important. Did you have any other sort of follow-up to that? Uh, ju ju just one, thank you, thank you very much. And, and so I certainly agree with, with Bert that, that it really doesn't matter. In some ways, it doesn't matter what the number is. You know, one kid using is too, is too many kids, right? Um, I, I get that completely. But if there are states out there that are doing something really well in this arena, um, then, you know, let's, let's find out what they're doing differently and, uh, and see if there's lessons to be learned. Absolutely. Any other questions in person? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what employers are saying about drug and alcohol and substance use for youth, especially, who, whom they're employing or trying to employ. I mean, we keep hearing that there are more jobs than there are workers. And we also see that we don't seem to have enough of a pipeline from high school to career-minded jobs as opposed to like entry-level service jobs. Um, but the employers really want them. You know, the employers are looking for more workers and there's some kind of disconnect happening in there where our like graduating seniors aren't thinking, who aren't going to college or don't have a tech, immediate tech direction. Um, they're not, you know, matched up with the employers and I'm wondering if drugs, if substance use has something to do with that. Did the audit, did the Zoom land hear the question? Okay, great. So I don't know if, if, so I'd like to turn it over and see if anyone has thoughts on that particular question about youth, but I know that 
not necessarily youth, but Bob could really speak to um, recovery-friendly workplaces, which is um, a, a little bit of what you're speaking to right now. Bob, would you be willing to? Sure. Uh, we're we're seeing uh, we, we we part of what we do here is to help people connect with employment jobs, and we are seeing more and more employers are actively concerned about alcohol and, and other drug use in the workplace, and looking for solutions that don't mean just letting go with the, of the employee. Of course, above a certain size, they have certain requirements under the Americans with Disability Act to offer employees treatment. But uh, but beside that, I just got a call today from. Uh, from a teacher at, at Vermont Tech, wanting wanting me or someone one of us to go there and talk about what supervisors should be looking for with employees who are struggling, and how should they approach it? You know, what should they expect, and how can they work with the employee? Because they're they're more and more concerned about not losing people, and that's a good thing. Uh, unfortunately, most small businesses don't have access to genuine employee assistance programs. But we're trying to, you know, we've had conversations about trying to stand something up that could be available to employee to employers. Uh, we're not there yet, but um, I say it's, so. It's it's still a problem. I mean, employers still, by and large, are struggling with this as well as their employees. But but they're trying to get better. And uh, and the key thing for employers is to know that that substance use disorder is a disease. is a It's what the scientists call a relapsing disease of the brain which means that you can't just expect them to, you know, go and sin no more. You know, uh, a person can start into recovery, but they are almost always in, are going to struggle and fall back. They don't necessarily lose the progress they've made. So what's important is for employers to understand what kind of disease we're dealing with here. And so they can reach out and maybe get kind of professional help in evaluating what an employee might need. At a certain point, they may have to separate the employee, but Short of that, uh, there's a lot that can be done to salvage employees if the employer knows enough about the disease model to uh, to work with the, the employee and to get the kind of help that can help them get back on their feet. Anything to add? Okay, so it doesn't directly answer your question. I don't know if we have a specific you know, answer to um, youth pipeline into employment, but certainly um, there are empty jobs and there are folks who need employment but might have um, difficulties due to um, criminal behavior that happened while they were actively using and, um, and that's a little bit of what Bob is speaking to. And there are organizations, including one called Working Fields, that partners with employers um, and they... <laughs> Yeah, I missed the question. I missed the, the point of the question. And yes, and that's exactly it. You know, that, that um, um, yeah, we, we work a great deal with people who are getting into recovery and in early recovery. Working Fields is a temp agency, essentially, that specializes in what they call second chance hires. So people coming into getting into recovery, uh, Working Fields has contracts with different employers. And what the agreement is, that, okay, we're going to send you somebody as a temp and you'll pay us by the day. If it's a certain point you decide you want to keep them, then they'll become a permanent employee. In the meantime, we will provide them with recovery coaching so that they can become stable in their recovery and not relapse and get on a good pathway as such that they can be a, a, a very productive permanent employee. And it turns out that they're very, they're very successful. They're doing very well. And the employees that are being hired are doing very well for the employers. But it takes a little bit for the employer to understand what this the process is. Now we have an arrangement with Working Fields that instead of using their own recovery coaches to support them, they're using ours. So for employers in central Vermont, if Working Fields has somebody working in a workplace, it's one of our recovery coaches that's gonna be supporting them while they're doing that. Because then we can also connect them with other resources they might need. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for your question. Yes, I'm a nurse here. And I just wonder what the best intervention or what would an ideal intervention look like if a student presented with drug or alcohol use while in school? What would you all want to see? What would be a perfect scenario for our students and helping them get through it? So on Zoom, the question is if a student is struggling with drug or alcohol use, what does that intervention look like in the school setting? 
going to look towards Bert or Evan? Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, that's one of the trickiest things, um, the, the intervention part. Um, you know, I think what the, what happens now, um, what happens now typically is if um, the school becomes aware of a young person um, using substances, then that's where we get a lot of referrals for our program is um, they'll contact us and ask us to do a substance use assessment. Um, because, um, you know, one of the real tricky things about this is, is that there, there's a couple of ways this usually comes to light. Sometimes it's because there's actually evidence of drug use. And sometimes it's about that you're seeing different behaviors and you're not always sure what's causing that. And um, substances is, is, is one thing to rule out there. It's just really always good to keep in mind that there's a lot of other things that could result in seeing unusual behaviors from, from uh, young people, especially, you know, things like depression, anxiety, learning issues, you know, the whole gamut of things that, that, that young people and older people can struggle with. Um, I don't know that there's a perfect intervention. I think the things that, that I think it really helps to, I, I, so only I'm, I'm just wondering, like, is a situation you're considering sort of like a young person who's sort of not really interested in, you know, they're not interested in doing anything either about their issue, but if they're, the fact that they have an issue comes to the attention of others. This is kind of what you're talking about? Well, I guess it's just a follow through. Should schools follow through more with these students or should we hand it over to the, the parents and hope that, that hope for the best? I just, um, it's hard to sit back and just hope for the best for me. I, okay, that that's that 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 that's helpful. I think you know, um, I think this is one one situation where more cooks are better, you know, because uh, a message being delivered from more places is helpful. And I think there's a really important. I think there's a. I think um, uh, for the schools for, you know, to work schools and parents and um, other resources like, you know, treatment providers like ourselves or other counselors, you know, there's, there's a lot of power in, this, in, in getting the same message from more places. And, you know, one of the, the most important things in helping is, um, is, is helping the youth find a reason why they might want to do something different. I mean, that's such a, that's such a big deal. There's not a lot that you can do um, if people are not willing to uh, participate. In other words, the person who has the problem is not willing to participate. So I think part of the power of hearing um, from more places, like I said, school parents and everybody working, you know, people working together is being able to sort of say, well, look how this is impacting your life, you know, and you also have people who are going to have a sense of what's important to this young person, maybe what what things are that they might actually, what kind of life do they want to have, you know, and this is, this is not easy information, you know, somebody comes into us and does a drug and alcohol assessment or sits with us for an hour, you know, it's not like we know them, we're still strangers, you know, and so people who've had ongoing contact with the young person, I think it can be really critical because they're going to have a sense of that person and be able to maybe um, help them understand why this is not working so well for them and put that in the context of, you know, who they want to be and how they want to be in the world. So, you know, in terms of that, I think so. I, so I think what it is really useful from schools is is um, not only and, and I think this really requires participate cooperation in the schools and the parents is not only referring a kid for a drug and alcohol assessment because what we do at the end of an assessment is we make recommendations but you know having there be the follow through on that you know it, it really it's really helpful if you know the school is encouraging follow through the parents are encouraging follow through all those things really increase the likelihood that somebody is going to you know one like get connected with with the help and 
you know, follow through, follow through on at least um, trying to make an effort there and trying to uh, um, be open to getting some of that help. Is that, is that a, okay, good. Okay. Yep. Thanks for, I think another challenge that schools might have is even identifying some students that might be struggling. Um, and we do have funding available um, for something called Youth Expert Screening Brief Intervention and Referral to Treatment, SBIRT. Um, where, and, and in this, uh, this program, uh, schools receive um, tablets and students say in homeroom will take an assessment and answer some questions on the tablet about um, you know their current substance use, some questions about self-harm, mental health, um, and then it will flag any students that rate sort of in a risky area for any of these um, different topics and alert school staff and school staff will develop their own protocols on site that they say, okay, here's how we're going to touch base with the student that we're concerned about. Um, so that is a program that we can help bring to schools um, that I think is really valuable. It has shown several other schools across the state are using this and expert is, a, is an evidence-based model that has been implemented in across the nation in a wide variety of settings. Um, but what a lot of schools have said is that it's helped them identify students that were just totally under the radar, that they just were like not, didn't realize were struggling um, and able to help them get connected. And it's not always necessarily treatment maybe, right, but they're getting referred to some support services um, in some way. Anne knows quite a bit more about this um, than I do. So if I've missed anything, please feel free to well, I guess I just want to add that um, that it is available, like Eva said, that we do have funding, and some of the schools are doing universal screening. So they'll do all of the students, or they might just do all the ninth graders to kind of see where things are at. So like with vision and hearing screening, we would add this in? So you would do mean? this, like would that just be an addition to? It could be like that. Yeah, it could be that everybody's going to take it. And one of the nice things about it is when students are answering the question, if um, it's pretty benign or they're saying they don't use, then they just jump to the next question. If they say that they are using, a, you know, it's like, oh, well, how many days a week? And, you know, um, it, it, it provides information about the substance in kind of a private way where our kids can understand a little bit more about it. And then there's a little bit of like a motivational interviewing component built into it. And then, like Eva said, it's not like you have to wait a year for the Youth Risk Behavior Survey data. You can get this information right away. And so a school would you know, have some staff available. Maybe you would clear your calendars for that week that you're implementing this um, screening so that you'll be able to follow up and find people who maybe already have a relationship with that student to even do help support. Yeah, and I think the, the other benefit to this is that um, to this program is that you're getting that data about that one student, right? It's like flagging you, hey, you know, Lucy's having some struggles with cannabis or whatever. But you also get an aggregated report on the back end in real time. So like Anne said, it's not like you're waiting for a wire BS, which is also really important and helps us be able to track how we're doing against um, this, the country, as you saw. But you would get this information about your school right now and where everything is at. Um, and you can start to use that to shift culture, which as we heard is one of the things that could really impact um, use rates. Mm -hmm. So we have lots of information about this. I'm really happy to share more with you. And it also just occurred to me that my mom was the school nurse here. Oh. <laughs> and I'm 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, um, I came here because I saw the statistics um, posted in, I don't know, it was the bridge or some other paper publication that I get, and I just, my jaw just dropped. And I felt like I needed to, well, obviously find some why, find some answers, and unfortunately, we don't know. Uh, we're saying it's cultural, maybe? It could be um, 
otherwise. And so that disturbed me even more greatly because <laughs> how do you fix that? And, and I mean, y'all are doing a great job um, getting word out and whatnot. I remember reading something when my kids are yet, were younger about the meals, having meals together, and it really impacted and struck me. I don't know if that's getting out into publications or, or whatnot. I don't know if um, there can be something, these like little bullet points of, as a parent, this is what you can do for your children. Don't pass out in front of them. Don't um, use marijuana in front of them. Have meals together. Just like really a bolt, like, like no brainer kind of stuff. Um, that seems pretty simplistic, but obviously these are things that are going on in people's homes. And um, my, my, I have a 17-year-old son and a 20-year-old son. They both attended U32 here. My oldest son said to me several years ago, he said, Mom, you do realize that nobody sits down to eat anymore together. Because I, I, that's what we do seven days a week at our house. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, doesn't happen. I, I was astounded. And I think because we're all so flippin' busy that we're all, well, Johnny's got this going on, Matilda has this, mom has this, dad has this, um, nobody's <laughs> in the house at the same time. And when your kids are there, they're in their bedroom, unless you summon them out of their room. So it takes effort as a parent to, and Someone's exhausted. Somebody's an alcoholic. I, I mean, I mean, to to me, it's absolutely overwhelming to think of how to solve this problem, or not even solve the problem, but how to address it. Um, so I guess I'm a little shocked, um, and just trying to take it all in, and I guess asking myself what I can, what I can do. Um, my kids don't use drugs or drink. I thought it was just chance, maybe not. Maybe I have had an impact, and I don't even know it. So that's saying a lot right there. Um, anyway. Can I respond to that? Yes, I am please. so happy you talked about that because I think parent education and parent yes. involvement is one is really such a key thing here. And you're raising the alarm, you know, the, this sense of urgency that parents need to do something about this. And every family is a little bit different, and kids are involved in different things. They're going back and forth between households. So sitting down for dinner X number of nights a week might really not be possible. I do have a friend who used to say, it's family dessert and every once in a while. And that would get their kids out of their room, you know, to either sit, sit down together to do something. There are some parents who are rallying together and saying, okay, we're going to talk about what our, what our rules or guidelines are, and we're all going to be on the same page. So if my kid's at your house, they're going to be supervised. There's not going to be alcohol available. You're not going to look the other way. You're not going to say, I'm just going to take away the keys and let kids be kids. You know, if they're out by a bonfire, you know, somebody's got to be there because you're right, there's already so much alcohol and cannabis um, abuse going on. So I think it's a lot of parent involvement. And um, so a little bit more parent education of giving people the tips of what they can do. And some things are not even occurring to parents. For instance, you know, go get me a beer from the fridge, you can open it for me. Or, you know, going out to dinner or going to a party and drinking a lot without having that conversation of saying, I'm only going to have one drink because I'm driving the family home tonight. You know, saying things out loud um, on, a, on a regular basis. And one of the things we do know is that parents are the number one influence on their kids' use. You know, they may experiment, but if they keep coming back to knowing that the parents have talked about it, that the parents would think it was wrong or not appropriate for them until they were 21. Those kids have that, have that in there. So even if there's a blip, very often they'll come back to that. So it's like Matt said, it's not just one 60-minute conversation. 
you know, it's 61 minute conversations. And that's where Parent Up um, can really, really help. And there's also another site on the health department um, website called Let's Talk Cannabis, which um, addresses some of that. But um, yeah, have it, you know, people have book groups. It'd be nice to have parent groups of, you know, what's this gonna look like for prom or, you know, graduation. Um, yeah? I wanted to just bring that up. Like, I, so I have a senior, and it's been COVID, right? Yeah. I don't think I've had one bit of parent education, and I have an older child too. Yeah. One bit of parent education has, you know, landed in my lap. Yeah. I'm sure it's been out there. You yeah. Know, but I, yeah. I didn't get the easy stuff. Right. Yeah. The past three years. Yeah. And, yeah. and I don't know if there's anything in place for prom or for graduation to be, you know, well, one, like we haven't even seen each other, and yeah. two, I don't think the schools are doing anything anymore for, you know, project graduation alternative stuff. Mm -hmm. And it, like, to be honest, it hasn't even occurred to me in the last, do I don't know if we would have a problem. Yeah. And now we are, so, like, oh my gosh, it's like next month. Right, and this is an unusual time, absolutely. And so, um, Bert Clavens um, with Washington uh, County Youth Service Bureau, and New Directions are putting together, um, you know, some parent presentations. And so, you know, if we have your email, we will add you to that list, and um, that's a good topic right there. You know, we'd like more input. Thanks, Anne. Yeah. Just have a couple of things to add to those points, and I know that we're right at about 7.30. Um, one is that, um, and, and this is going a bit back to Larry's point from earlier, one of the things that's different and unique about Vermont is that we are a rural state. Um, and I think that we sometimes forget this. And even Montpelier and Barrie are rural by federal you know, qualifications. And rural people in surveys, um, rural people, they tend to feel more self-reliant. And like they should be able to take care of their problems on their own without reaching out for help, whereas in a city, it's different. And you might be a lot more likely to just quickly knock on your apartment neighbor's door, or the, the connections are just different, and, and study after study has shown this. Mattering to the community and feeling like you're a part of the community and um, having an adult other than your parent who you are connected with are really big protective factors in youth, uh, in, in, and reducing risky behaviors in youth. And so I think that that's something to consider, like is there a, you, you know, is there a young person in your life that you could really connect with? Um, and you may, they may roll their eyes at you or look like they're not listening, but they really are and that's really important. Um, and I think that that piece about this rural attitude of sort of like, I can do this on my own and being disparate and isolated and often far away from other people the add on a pandemic, right? That's made that a lot worse. You can start to see where some of those things are challenging um, in, a, in a rural area. So it is something to consider um, and what makes us sort of different and unique. But that mattering to the community is really, really um, an important piece. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, I want to thank you all so much for being here tonight. We have so much pizza, so please take some pizza. Sorry, Zoom. Um, next time. I can put the pizza emoji in the chat for you. But um, what we'd like to do before you...